Our next guest is Kwame Dawes, and sometimes there are no words for coping with the disaster. Sometimes it's all we have. Kwame Dawes is poet in residence at the University of South Carolina. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, it's good to be here, and it's really fascinating to hear these discussions. Um, I was in Oregon on the day of the earthquake in Haiti. I was teaching a writing workshop um, with some MFA students who were doing creative writing. I went to my room to get something and I saw the news on television that there was a horrible earthquake in Haiti. A few hours later, I got a call from a friend of mine called Andre Lambertson, a remarkable photographer and photojournalist. And he said, I want to go to Haiti. And I said, OK, you know what just happened in Haiti? He says, yeah, that's why I want to go to Haiti. And he said, will you come with me to Haiti to tell this story? Eventually, we talked about a plan, and we got in touch with the Pulitzer Center on crisis reporting. And the plan became a journey to Haiti to tell the story of HIV AIDS in Haiti after the earthquake. I guess part of the reason that it became that focus was that I had done some work in Jamaica some years before on HIV in Jamaica. And during my work in Jamaica, I had learned a great deal about Haiti and about the work that was done in Haiti and the, the significant changes and improvements that had taken place in Haiti with regards to HIV AIDS. And it occurred to me and occurred to us that this earthquake could have had a tremendous and dramatic effect on that work that has already been had already been accomplished. I decided not to go when everybody was going at the beginning. I'm not a hardcore journalist. I'm the journalist who told the photographers in Jamaica when we went into Arnett Gardens, which is a tough little part of Kingston, that if there's any sign of trouble, I'm running. <laughs> you all can stay behind. And I explained that the reason I can run is that, unlike you, I can imagine what happened <laughs> and write about it. And it'll be just as good. <laughs> you need to be there, but I don't. But that wasn't the real reason why I didn't want to go to Haiti when everybody was there. I know that the work I do is work that is done when people are reflecting upon their experience, when people are quiet, in the moments when nobody is really talking to anybody, in the moments when people expect you to have gotten over it. And that is a time when it's most difficult. And that is a time when everything has slowed down. And that's the time when I go in to talk to people and to find out where they are and what has happened. The stories I tell about the people I met in Haiti are simple stories. When I tell them in poetry, it's not because I'm excited about what they've told me, but it's because there's something intuitive and something deeply moving about a moment that may not make for a great article, but it tells you something profound about what people are experiencing. So what I'll share with you are just a few things today. Andre Lambertson is the photographer who worked with me, and he's a remarkable photographer. And the images that you'll see are the images that he took as we traveled through Haiti. We went four times to Haiti together, spent about a week and a half each time meeting people, talking to people, and finding out their stories. We'll see three of what I call these video poems that tell a story. And then I'll read one poem um, which will tell just another story. The first piece is called Tombs. And one of the first experiences I had when I landed in Haiti was to be overwhelmed by the rubble. It was all over the place. Cars had to navigate around it. We visited a hospital. 
And the hospital was now, had shifted because the main building had collapsed or had been badly damaged. So they were having the, you know, they were doing the, all the treatment outside and in, you know, shelters and in a, you know, makeshift areas. And one of the doctors pointed to the building and, and began to explain who was in the building. And he said, they are still there. They are still entombed in the stone. And he talked about who was on the first floor and who was on the second floor when the earthquake struck. So I'll share the piece, Tombs. And I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to mess this up because this is not, I'm a Mac person. And these <laughs> peculiar. All day long I watch over line. a town that's broken. Josephat Robert Large. Every crumbled building is a tomb. We step over gray crushed bricks and the entanglement of steel. The faint scent of death still in the air. Every sliver of laughter dries in the heat, the dust, the stones, the dust, the stones. The doctor offers a wry smile, shrugs his shoulders and says, c'est la vie qui part. He points to the gray slabs of cement where the hospital once stood. He counts 18. The women in maternity with their babies and their families counting fingers and toes. They were on the second floor. On the first were the diligent nurses. At the top were the broken bodies of the healing. And they are all entombed in the stone. For days, the scent of their rotting blanketed our skins. Now, after the blue helmeted soldiers sprayed the ruins, and they've done this before, it is bearable. Death sulks in the corner, like our hearts which leap at each sound of rumbling. The city dances to live, the music leaping against despair. An old woman skips to avoid a truck. This earth devours the dead with such efficiency. And we are left with our heads covered in dust, our eyes searching for familiar faces, our hearts safely tucked away. All right, thank you. We've talked a lot about the ways in which journalists can experience a place and journalists can write about a place. We've talked about the peculiar dialogue between sensationalism and, and actually trying to get the story out. We talk about the wrestling between issues. And I'll be honest with you, I, I understand that wrestling I think we make choices when we are in that position as journalists. I've always imagined a simple situation, like one when we were in Ardent Gardens in Jamaica. And there was, an, there was a thought of where would we take a photograph? If you had a building and you had this, this beautiful hibiscus tree that somebody has cultivated and planted for, for a long time, a woman who is in great crisis, but she's worked hard to cultivate this beautiful hibiscus plant. But beside that hibiscus plant in front of her house is a dung heap, just a lot of garbage, just a mess, an ugly mess and so on. The question then arises, where do you take the picture of her? In front of the hibiscus plant or in front of the dung heap? And it's an interesting question because the truth is both of them are true, absolutely but both communicate completely different things at the same time. And I think the wrestle is always to find the human dignity in the experience. That's my rich need. That is my compelling need in the work that I do and I try to do. I suspect my choice would be the hibiscus plant. And the reason I would do that is probably because we know she's messed up anyway. And it's the contrast that creates beauty. And maybe it's just because I'm a poet. 
I'm going to read a poem for a young man who we met in Port-au-Prince, living with HIV AIDS. His name, I'll just say, is Carmelo. Carmelo is 17 years old when we met him. He came from a family. His mother was HIV positive. She had birth, gave him the disease when she was born. In other words, he contracted it in, at birth. His younger brother was HIV positive, and his two sisters, younger sisters, were not. So it's a, what we call a blended family. As he told me the story of his experience, it was very moving and it touched me a great deal. And I just want to read the poem I wrote for him. It's called Boy in Blue. His voice is licked with his dreams. His voice is licked, but his dreams are the artillery of words loaded to uncoil our strength. Michel-Ange Hippolyte. The words cluster behind your teeth, close in, the smooth patina deep brown of your face is alight with the effort. You, boy, carrying the weight of an old man, this body of yours broken again and again by the accident of your birth. I follow the slow wave of your thick lashes. You are counting the words, searching your heart for the right music. Sometimes I wonder why Sometimes I wonder if my mother did this, then I grow dark. The world swallows light around me. Then I cry. Only sometimes I cry and then I laugh just like that. In a few seconds, I laugh and then I cry and I dream again. A drum and incendiary tongues darting through the low rafters would be easier. A prophet speaking, telling us the way of the moving earth, the rubble of our city. Even the priest with his soft horse eyes, his mouth moving quickly over my skin. Even that would be easier than this silence. The dark streets of the city, the heat in my skin, my mother praying in the shadows, singing from deeper than I will ever go. And when I sing, I know how to fly and how to reach where the water eases the spinning in my stomach. And this blood is not my enemy when I sing. We leave you in the growing dusk. The scent of rain is heavy in the air. Somewhere beside the broken palace, the sky opens up. And the streets flood, the sound of cataclysms so normal now. I imagine you like these children dancing in the deluge, naked as holiness. I'll read one more poem and then we'll look at the final piece that I want to share with you. The next poem I'll read is a poem for a man called Joel Santon. I've written pieces about Joel Santon. There was a, a feature piece that I wrote for the USA Today about him. Joel is an interesting man. He's a man who is living with HIV AIDS. He's a reverend, but he ha his congregation are the people in Carrefour who have the disease. And he travels around each day, a man who does barely has any food to eat himself, praying for people, looking after them, encouraging them to get treatment, and caring for them. He started his own NGO, his own little organization, a grassroots organization to work with these people. Joel is a remarkable person because once I met him and we started to follow him around, um, I just became overwhelmed by his, res well, there's the resilience, yes, but the very clear on understanding of what his role is in his community. And I think it's a tremendously heroic kind of position that Joel, uh, Joel occupies in, in his community, but he doesn't see it that way. This is a poem I wrote for him called Job. And, you know, the, the allusion is a, is a little obvious, but here it is. For Joel Santon. This is a home. This is a shelter. These walls shaken. The lines of jagged cracks. The split at the ceiling that lets in light and rain. This is my comfort here, deep in the catacombs of Port-au-Prince, 
shaded by a giant breadfruit tree with its fragile branches, its bounty. Here, where the yard is cluttered with trash, drying leaves and broken bricks. Salvage from the ruins dumped here for use, they keep saying later. They being those searching through the broken houses for paper, and if truth be told, for money, bread, pots, clothes, and an answer to our calling of her name. This is home where I pray each night, teach me the calculus of Job, teach me the madness of Hosea, teach me how to be a priest of suffering, teach me how to have gambled your name for my gain, teach me to dream of open skies, air clear as creek water for these ravaged lungs, fruit to flesh out these bones under my beaten skin, sugar to make me fat. May you wake me before the next cataclysm that I might rise and leave this place before it too collapses, all like all things have. Teach me how to sleep deeply with faith that you will wake me when it's time, and teach me to sleep with no hope of rising under this cracked shelter. Teach me, this man, listless like this, blood sick like this, shunned like this. Teach me the way of Job. Teach me. I'll end with a piece that came out of an experience we had when we traveled to a small town just outside of Port-au-Prince called Gantier. And we went to Gantier to meet a family of Malia John, another Haitian woman who started her own organization to work with women living with HIV AIDS. And after the earthquake, her task was to find many of these women, to care for them, to look after them, to find out what their situation was. And we, we, we decided to, to, to tell her story and follow her. But in Gantier, we went to a church service where she was. And the church itself had been badly damaged by the earthquake. And they were meeting outside in a little compound area. And something struck me about that service. Of course, the, the music that was being played and performed was music of voice and tambourines and, and graters and, and the shak shak. And, and it was a powerful, moving music. And then uh, while the service was going on, there was a woman walking around the congregation, just walking in a circle. All she was doing was walking and muttering. I think she was praying. And I was just moved by that. And I asked afterwards, who is that woman? And they said, she's the mother of the church. And that was Malia John's mother. In a sense, the women of Haiti have carried the burden, for instance, of HIV AIDS. They are the ones who go and get tested because they're pregnant and they carry the news. They're the ones who tell the men that they're HIV positive, even if they contracted it from the men. And in many ways, they are at the front line. And when this earthquake took place, the stories I heard about the first responders and the care that was given to people and the help by Haitian people, many of those stories were about women and the strength of those women. So this poem called Mother of Mothers is for is for um, those women um, who, who I met. The faces of mothers of mothers, their cheekbones gleaming against taut skins, their eyes glazed with the scarring of so much loss. In Haiti, the mothers of mothers have lamented for so long all that is left is the sturdy presence of grace, the wide open heart of knowing how much a casket weighs, how it feels on the open palm. The mothers of mothers march through the congregation while the children of men clap their hands, beat tambourines, scratch the grater, and sing the flat harmony that shivers the air. Beneath a cascade of flame yellow and red flamboyants, 
She stalks the outskirts of the feet-worn worship ground, the outer limits of the congregation where the weeds and stones have accumulated. Here, where the excavation of rubble takes us as far as weary arms and the creaky wheelbarrow can go. These women draw a pattern of circles with their heavy, planted feet, their arms raised high, their voices continuing with greater ceremony and occasion, that conversation that began with Jesus at four in the morning. Oh, the mothers of mothers, who know too well the hottest sorrow, the broken bodies of children, the boy who covers a jaw full of maggots, and the tall lanky son whose spine gives under the weight of concrete before he is pulled out, laid under the soft blue light of a wayside clinic, waiting to go, and quietly, with the flies returning to his skin, he is still, though he must wait there until dusk before they notice, before a procession of mothers leads the body out into the night. And mother of mothers, she hears her child wake, look around and speak. How nice the air is out here before he dies, this time for good. Mothers of mothers, in your bandana, and with your holy testament, you must draw the line of defense around the beleaguered souls and speak a torrent of curses on the beast lurking in the shadows. What we did, the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting, we translated these poems into Creole. And um, with the help of organizations in Haiti, we've been able to, 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 to present them there. It was my commitment that whatever work we could get into translation into Creole, we'll try to do. Um, the mission of the Pulitzer Center is to bring new stories here. But it's also f acutely aware that there's an audience that goes beyond America that responds to the stories that we tell. And it's my feeling, actually, that the awareness of that audience keeps us on our toes and keeps us honest and, and keeps us sincere about the work that we do. So thank you for paying attention to a little poetry. Can't hurt. Thank you. <laughs>